Thank you, Mr. Moderator, well, Mr. MC. And there's a moment for while the gentleman of the evening plugs in his guitar. <laughs> and uh, the mo uh, sorry, all protocols established. Professor Harris, uh, Mrs. Petty Barnett, um, Dr. Petty Barnett, all the other dignitaries and CXC family. So many of you this evening. Thank you very much for being here. There are two other major happenings this evening. So we're extremely happy that you're here. The moderator, the MC indicated to you that Dr. Liverpool and myself are, have been close friends. And I remember meeting him in 1981 at Carrie Fester here in Barbados. And then we met up in Jamaica, I think two years later, marking history. And I must put in this fact that in 1989, 25 years ago, we started something which is still going in Jamaica, the famous or infamous Markers concert, at which he was the stellar performer or headliner. So I don't really need to tell you all about it, except to say that we Caribbean people need to pay attention to our outstanding artists. I remember last year, Professor Liverpool came to a conference here in Barbados, and when we were planning the conference, and I must say this, uh, I insisted that we invite, uh, as one of the speakers, uh, Dr. Hollis Liverpool from Trinidad and Tobago. And there was some objection to it. Who's this? And I said, well, um, okay, chalk does. And someone argued, what is a, a mere Calypsonian doing in an intellectual forum? <laughs> <laughs> and people who know me will be surprised that I did not utilize some swear words to put them in their place. <laughs> I calmly said, I calmly said, Dr. Hollis Liverpool is as well educated and as well accredited as Professor E. Nigel Harris or any other prominent member of our distinguished university. He had O levels, A levels. He did a bachelor's in history. He did a master's in history, he did a master's in, in uh, Calypso studies. He is one of the first ethnomusicological uh, doctoral uh, students and successfully completed it at Michigan University. And I'm not reading this, I know about it, right? Because I followed his uh, progress, his trajectory, and supported him at every level. Uh, as the Calypsonian Chalk Dust, and that is how you know him, and he called himself Chalk Dust because he was a teacher, Mucurapo Sr. Uh, he <coughs> moved from there, he was an assistant professor in Michigan, he's worked all over the place, and ended up in his own native Trinidad as professor of Calypso art, as you know, at, and he worked at the University of St. Augustine, now he is at the University of TNT. But he was called Chalk, that's because he took that name, that's Sorike, because he teacher Calypsonian, Chalk and Dust. Right? My friend, a few of us, like the director of National Insurance Services, and I call him Chalk Eye, right? because he is both he straddles uh, two cultures, the culture of Jamaica and Selassie I, and also the culture of Trinidad and Tobago, Chalk does. Uh, um, much more I would not want to say about him. I've been cautioned by CXC people not to deliver one of my lectures. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good time to wrap up. I want to say also that he, he's a proud father, the right, husband of Ruth and proud father of four young ladies, Michelle, Gillian, Suzette, Ngozi, and his son, Brian. My 
all of my um, theoretical godchildren. And one of his granddaughters, Kai, the daughter of Michelle, where is she? Please rise. <laughs> Kai, Chalky's granddaughter. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. And your fa grandfather will now present the lecture. <laughs> the Calypso as, as an art form for institutional studies, resistance, acceptance, and the journey ahead. Chao Kai. <laughs> Oh, how my heart goes out to my people. I mean the poor and the working class who got to work all day for little or no pay until judgment come to pass. They got to make up their mind for pressure till they go in down to the grave. Cause the wicked and powerful master treating them hand to mouth like slave. They got to keep on working hard Toiling till they smelling bad And in the evening when the sun goes down I'm fast they tired Oh my lord But they coming back the following day Because they really need the extra pay To buy food to be strong enough To come back and work hard, 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 hard Moderator, Trevor Marshall, distinguished friends, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, being a Calypsonian and professor of Calypso arts, I have naturally started this address, as I always do, with a Calypso. This Calypso is the first verse of one entitled The Worker's Lament and was sung in 1973 by the mighty composer. Like CXC, this Calypso is celebrating its 40th anniversary. In it, composer shows the plight of the working class in the Caribbean. They are forced to work hard in order to come back next day to work hard. And the schedule goes on until they die. And since so many of us in the Caribbean have simply lived our lives toiling in somebody's plantation or vineyard, and since it was composed on the birth date, around the birth date of CXC, I thought it a most fitting Calypso verse with which to begin. Through the Calypso, one can tell what life was like when CXC started. I wish to thank Mrs. Giles and the CXC Secretariat for inviting me to give this address on this the 40th anniversary of the CXC examination and to assure you that I consider it a privilege for me so to do. I started marking CXC exam scripts on Caribbean history in the 1970s, late 1970s. And I used to look forward anxiously to do so in those early days. For I certainly learned a lot, not only about how to mark papers, but about Caribbean history and Caribbean historiography. We worked hard in CXC then to come back every year to work hard. <laughs> I remember all too well when in the early 1980s, Art forms in the Caribbean was added to our Caribbean history exam, and I must compliment the CXC for that. And it stands out in my memory like a huge rock in my ocean of history, because then students wrote three pages in response to the question on Amerindian society, five pages on African enslavement, one page on social life in the Caribbean after emancipation, and one line on art forms in the Caribbean. <laughs> in addition, most questions on the theme, art forms in the Caribbean, centered around Mrs. Edna Manley's sculpture, not, not so treasure, Trevor, and very, very little, if any at all, focused on music in the Caribbean. Yet music remains the most expressive of our Caribbean art forms, since all islands covered by CXC have music, and more so the Calypso, which is certainly the most prolific, creative, and popular music of the historically British Caribbean islands and the US Virgin Islands and even the US British Virgin Islands. 
probably the fact that in the 1980s, as independent and in some cases semi-independent nations, probably because of that, the Caribbean was still struggling over accepting the Calypso as world music or as a tool for education, for, or even as music worthy of being sung. That may have been the reason why a little emphasis was placed on it by CXC. No need for me to tell you that Africans in the Caribbean, using the bases and constructs from their ancestors, developed and spread the Calypso throughout the islands and the Caribbean diaspora by way of carnival and the migratory habits of our peoples. It spread too because of the commonalities in our cultural traits and the fact that music of all the Caribbean peoples has been structure structurally influenced by our native African ancestors who came from Africa during the period of African enslavement. I, went, I once I went to that, that Carifesta lecture here in 1981, given by a Cuban, a Cuban lecturer, and they brought a group to sing Guantanamera in front of him, and he ran them. I don't know if Trevor remember that. He ran them, and he, he said, get out of here, get out of here. 1981, right here in Barbados, he said, Cuban music is African. Cuban music is African. Now, you know for a fact that in colonial times, local music and customs in the Caribbean were described as folklore. And people who dared to study local music, such as Dr. J.D. Elder from Trinidad, Sylvia Winter and Olive Lewin from, from Jamaica, Flora Spencer, Trevor Marshall, and Maud Wilkins from Barbados were called folklorists. In fact, music identified with peasant culture was called folk, and that of urban areas or, or identified with Europeans was called urban or even classical. The truth is, all music where people share things in common is folk music. Since the term folk refers to people sharing and participating and we know that music is only music when it is shared by culture-bearing folks. It is a truism that in the era before the British colonies gained their independence, Caribbean peoples rejected the Calypso as music worthy of any institutional study. Hence my theme this evening is the Calypso as an art form for institutional studies resistance, acceptance, and the journey ahead. It is true that from the pre-emancipation period, Calypsonians have used the Calypso to resist colonials and overlords. But our academics and elites have also in the pre-independence era resisted attempts to use the art form for institutional study. Hence, I address the concept of resistance at the onset we simply resisted attempts to bring it into the classroom. You see, ladies and gentlemen, for many, Calypso in pre-independence times, what, Calypso wasn't even music. I can give you countless examples of that rejection, but in the, interest in, time, in the interest of time, let me give you a few. A few will suffice. One, Professor Gordon Rollier noted that in the 1960s, at a convent school for girls in San Fernando, Trinidad, quote, all convent girls had to attend a special retreat before carnival to atone for all the sins <laughs> that people would be committing at carnival time, unquote. He went on to say, quote, every calypso was another wound in Christ's side and in the sacred heart of his mother, unquote. Example two, when I was a schoolboy at St. Mary's College in Port of Spain, Trinidad, I was caught singing calypsos in class, and I was given a billet to take to the dean, you know, this little billet to say what this boy did. And I, I peeped into the billet. I peeped into the billet, I opened the billet, and I peeped into it, and it was written on the billet, Dear Father, this boy Liverpool has been doing the devil's work. <laughs> singing calypso, the devil's work. In Port of Spain, at a, at a special Chinese restaurant in the 1950s and up to the 60s, Calypsonians used to entertain the consumers of Chinese food by singing at the tables. It was called hustling. The hustling at this restaurant stopped when the Chinese owners put up a sign at the entrance of the restaurant. Very large, it read, 
No Calypsonians and dogs allowed. That is history. No Calypsonians and dogs allowed. You may be startled at the word, at the use of the word dog to describe the Calypsonian, but Calypsonian Lord Irie, who I interviewed in 1973, he informed me that he preferred to sing gospel and European love songs because in the 1950s, quote, a Calypsonian was a dog, unquote. You might remember Lord Kitchener in the 1960s and Calypso. I go dance in the land, I don't care who says. I can't wait until Gloria Saturday. In other words, you couldn't sing Calypso in Lent. Not only in Trinidad, throughout the whole Caribbean. You couldn't sing Calypso in Lent. And all radio stations never played the Calypsos in Lent. Another example of Calypso rejection came from my interview with Lord Superior. And Lord Superior was quick to tell me that in the, in the 50s, in Parliament, there used to be quote, there used to be one black woman in the Calypso tent in the front seat, Mrs. Audrey Jeffers. Audrey Jeffers is the aunt of deceased historian Tony Martin. You see why Tony Martin became a historian. Another example of rejection was the fact that all military personnel and members of the public service in Trinidad and Tobago had to obtain permission from the authorities to sing a calypso on a calypso stage. And talking to Gabby, short shirt, and Blakey in St. Thomas, I learned that the same reprehensive outlook to the Calypso occurred right here in Barbados, Antigua, and the Virgin Islands, respectively. I want to remind you, too, that Calypsonian Swallow was dismissed by Liat in the early 1970s. With his fame today, they dare not do that. But perhaps the most unkindness cut of all was my case in 1968 when I was dragged before the Teaching Service Commission, the body responsible for disciplining teachers in Trinidad and Tobago, I was dragged before them to say why I was, quote, singing calypsos and gaining emoluments under the crown while employed as a teacher in the teaching service. <laughs> Unquote. I have a simple program for this big yard to become a showpiece of dignity to reflect the identity. After six years of independence, I was charged for singing calypsos and found guilty. And while awaiting formal dismissal by letter, it was the voice of the then Prime Minister, Dr. Eric Williams, that caused the authorities to reinstate me. It came about when Dr. Eric Williams was at a function and a journalist asked him about the chocolate situation and Eric Williams made the famous words, famous words, I don't know why they humbugging the young man for. <laughs> and those words, ladies and gentlemen, those words reinstated me. <laughs> I think Sparrow caps it nicely. Sparrow sang, Calypsonians rarely catch hell for a long time. If you know you can sing with me, don't forget. 68 yourself with them was a big crime. If your sister talked to a steel bandsman, the family want to break she hand, put she out, lick out every teeth in she mouth, pass your out cars. That's nice. Don't be afraid to sing. <laughs> Perhaps one of the reasons why CXC didn't exploit the Calypso was the fact that we in Trinidad and Tobago refused to give any status to the creolized tongue of Caribbean people. We laughed at everybody who was different. <laughs> we ridiculed Vincentians, we ridiculed Barbadians and Grenadians, especially in Calypso. We told Grenadians, you know, the Grenadians used to run for the ball and, the, and the, in cricket and saying, go for it, go for it, go for it. And we sang, go for it, go for it, go for it in the boundary. We ridiculed Barbadians. Why them Barbadians living in this land? I am begging the immigration to do the best they can. <laughs> I don't know if you know this one by Blakey. Every day they're talking about how they have so much land. Back home in Grenada, Barbados and Burnham land. But still they won't go home. How these bloody people just think. Look, Trinidad, getting too heavy. A frightened country sink. 
Send them back to the land. All them Bajans, send them back to the land. And Grenadians are talking as man. To all you immigration, I can't take the jam. The place to ram cram. So before the thing explode, yes, we say explode. Take your bundle and go. Blakey again, 1960. He has something against Bajans. <laughs> And we told St. Lucians. All them St. Lucians are custom bathing in a calabar. Bathing, drinking, sleeping, waking in a. Every St. Lucian are custom bathing in a. I see my partner hiding his face in a. Well, we kept, we, kept, we kept the worst. We kept the worst for the Grenadians. Move, let me get me share. They beating Grenadians in Woodford Square. I must pelt a lash. Let me get me share. They beating Grenadians in Woodford Square. Since they here, we got federation. All of them pack up here in this island. Immigration putting them under arrest. The policeman teasing them on arrest. If you see how they holding these camps and them friends, you're born to burn. Some of them could read and spell, but they can't pronounce at all. The policeman telling them, say, pig, you stupid man. And as they say, hag, licks in the police van. <laughs> Blakey again. Of course, the different political systems that unders underscore the crown colonies the different monetary systems used in the Caribbean, the different requirements for entry into the islands, the different educational systems before CXC, the fact that we didn't esteem sufficiently our Creole tongues all contributed to the insularism that caused the Federation to fail in 1962 and perhaps to make CXC desist from using the Calypso as a form of institutional study. Sociologist Pete Simon, now deceased, he may have actually summed up the reason why CXC and the Midland upper classes in the Caribbean resisted the Calypso as a tool for study. The problem lay in the manner in which the singers deported themselves, he said, and he wrote, in 1969, he wrote, day to day, now for now living was the Calypsonian's way of life, the life of the chartered libertine. He had no roots and was proud of it. He spent money as soon as it come, as soon as it came to hand. Easy come, easy go, was the rule. Drinking, gambling, and womanizing were his main pursuits. A home as such was not in his scheme of things. He was, more often than not, quite content with his bachi. Many of the times he would wake up on the counter of some bar or club room, drunk like a fish, and ask for an eye opener, then stumble out to face an uncompromising world. I hope you know what's an eye opener. Is that a straight? Well, Pete Simon, dear friends, was not only describing Calypsonians in the 1960s. He was describing Calyps the behavioral attitudes of Calypsonians, panmen, masqueraders, jamets, and all the downtrodden and dispossessed masses, victims of British colonial thought. I now turn to acceptance of the art form as a form of institutional study. And this occurred slowly but pointedly. The 1970 Black Power confrontation in Trinidad and Tobago, folks, changed many things, changed many concepts and beliefs. It embraced, as it were, the Calypso. It embraced the Calypso, and it laid the foundation for its acceptance in many sites, nationally and internationally. The movement in 1970 was even used, they even used the Calypso to communicate its feelings, including its demands for freedoms to the Eric Williams regime in 1970. So, Kitchener sang. And you can sing along with me. A glad for Gettys Granger, a glad for weeks also, a glad for all them detainees, I'm so glad we let them go. We captured them one morning, they beat them without fail. They innocently put black people straight in royal jail. Oh, what a country! 
Oh, what an awful sin. How come you could be jailing people so without a hearing? Where is our freedom? Somebody put a hand. Oh, come the vengeance of Moko will surely fall on this land. Kitchener. See, most people think Kitchener is only saying would match. <laughs> Capturing history. And when in 1934, the Theatre and Dance Hall License was, Act was passed in Trinidad Tobago, the Act itself was conceived to silence the Calypsonian, who, to the authorities, was calling the names of, quote, respectable people in his songs. And the Hamilton Report on the Cambole Riots of 1881 made the point Hamilton was was investigating the riots, and Hamilton informed the British that, quote, the vilest songs in which the, the names of ladies of the land, unquote, are being introduced in the songs. The fact is that Calypsonians used the Calypso vehemently to air the grievances of the lower classes and forced by their exuberance, the middle and upper classes, to accept the art form as the national voice of sufferers. Indeed, the upper classes, since in the 1950s, had already observed the influence of the political calypso on the masses. Freedom and all its relevant concerns was the main theme in the hundreds of calypsos sung from the 1930s to the turn of the century. The middle and upper classes after 1970 recognized the calypso for what it was truly worth. It was a potent force for change a litany of expressions that few English poets could match, and music equal to, and in most cases, superseding the so-called classical music of Beethoven, Mozart, and Chopin. And thus, GB, no understanding acceptance, and he noted that the art form was at last accepted as music, causing GB to sing in the 1980s, and, and GB sang, Take my calypso music to the mountain. Let every drop of earth hear what I say. Out of them barrack yards, calypso rising. Taking off that old time style. Putting on a brand new smile. Rising out of the ghettos of third world. Starvation, reaching out to tomorrow with a world vibration. My Calypso is heading for stardom real quick because it is world music. Beautiful, eh? Beautiful. <laughs> and, 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 listen, and listen to the and listen to the mule, and look at the melody. Beautiful. Acceptance of the art form was given a boost. When top Calypsonians, such as Sparrow, Melody, Kitchener, Lion, Spitfire, and Lord Superior, to name a few, not only clothed themselves in a sartorially elegant manner on and off stage, but they drove fancy cars and built spacious, towering homes that few upper class folks could afford. Indeed, Kitchener's house in Trinidad is named Rinorama Palace built from the profits of his tune, Rinorama. The same can be said of Short Shirt, King Obstinate, and Swallow in Antigua, Arrow in Monstrat, and Beckett in St. Vincent. I didn't mention Barbados. <laughs> Acceptance of the art form occurred too because of the crowds that could be found at Calypso Tents, today it is dwindling, at road and road shows. Moreover, the universities outside of the Caribbean long before our own UE began to use the Calypso as an instrument for the study of the social sciences. The University of Texas, occasioned by the presence of Dr. Errol Hill, Professor Errol Hill. The University of Ibadan, illuminated by the mind of Dr. J.D. Elder. The University of Michigan, using Panis Board of Tripoli Steel Band fame. The University of Florida, occasioned by Professor Carol Boyce Davies, Mr. Alvin Albino at the schools in Montreal, Mr. Cliff Alexis of Northern Illinois University, and the University of the Virgin Islands, where I taught, all used the Calypso before our own University of the West Indies in Trinidad as a tool for institutional study. My grandmother used to say, 
cock does crow in the morning, but very few people just get up. <laughs> well, obviously, you really didn't hear the cock crowing because they didn't get up. <laughs> but I must, I, I must single out a few persons. I must single out a few persons who heard the cock crowing and got up. People like my friend and moderator, Trevor Marshall, Royal Gibbons in Trinidad, and deceased Professor Rex Nettleford from Jamaica. These are people who worked hard in the cultural vineyard in the 1980s to instill into the CXC examiners and authorities the need for using local clips of music as a form of institutional study and a tool for the education of the masses. I think Trevor deserves a nice round of applause. Acceptance was furthered in the 1980s and 1990s by the many secondary and tertiary schools, commercial companies and organizations, all holding calypso contests at carnival time and on festive occasions. The, people, the PNM, the People's National Movement in Trinidad, the party, even had its own national competition in the 1970s and 80s. It was called the Bilocal Contest. And that was, it was done to spread the idea of the need to support local industry. Indeed, many of today's singers, such as Singing Sandra, Lord Relator, Kurt Allen, and Sugarloos, they emerged out of the private contests held at schools and organizations. The Prime Minister's Better Village program also, that program national in scope and meant to focus on the culture of the locals, also encouraged the spread and acceptance of Calypso. Acceptance of the Calypso was further enhanced by the University of the West Indies later on, granting doctorates to first Sparrow and later Black Stalin and Gabby for their lyrical prowess and to Roy Cape for his ability to interpret musically the compositions of the bards. In Antigua too, the government saw it fit to bestow knighthood on short shirt and swallow for their contribution to human development. Such accolades informed the world that the work of these Calypsonians amounted in quality, and certainly in quantity, to doctoral dissertations. I remind you of what C.L.R. James said of Sparrow. Following the death of the West Indies Federation in 1962, C.L.R. James said that Sparrow's Calypso is the best academic paper on the downfall of the Federation, the best academic paper. You know, many people don't believe that Calypsoans can write papers. <laughs> people want to know why Jamaica run from the Federation. If you want to know why Jamaica run from the Federation. Jamaica have a right to speak she mind. That is my opinion. And if you believe in democracy, you'll agree with me. If they know they didn't want federation. And they know they don't want to unite as one and only one. Tell the doctor you're not in favor. Don't behave like a blasted. This is no time to say you are federated. How many people in UE could write that? <laughs> it is the outstanding lyrical content of these bards that caused the university to bestow on them the high accolades. Here Swallow, for instance, Swallow has been, give, has been knighted. Here Swallow. When them islands get in a jam, they come to Trinidad. Eric, help your brother man, things bad. And Eric with his heart and soul like a big brother, Making sure he lend them some of the petrol dollar. It's better to borrow than to thief. With this, you must agree. Because things can't be good when, you do, when you're done financially. Some of them just borrow and borrow and don't give back. It's a piece of covetousness. You know, it's a fact. Trinidad is the big brother of the Caribbean. All of them rest of the islands just borrow money like rain. From Grand Cayman down to Guyana, making use of the oil dollar, Trinidad, our big brother, is the Caribbean godfather. Swallow in the 1980s. 
And then, <laughs> and then there is Black Stalin, who on commenting on Caribbean unity, gave us the following lines. You try with a federation, the whole thing end in confusion. You must think with me. Carry come and then carry after, but somehow a smelling disaster. Mr. West Indian politician, I mean you went to big institution. And how come you can't unite seven million? When a West Indian unity, I know is very easy. If you only rap to your people and tell them like me, that is one race, the Caribbean, from the same place, that made the same trip on the same ship. So we must have one common intention for a better life in the region, for we women and we children. That must be the ambition of the Caribbean man, the Caribbean man, the Caribbean man. And why did they give, why did they give Gabby? <laughs> Making a strong case for, against neocolonialism, Gabby, you sing it for me. Jack, Jack, don't want me to... I don't know it. You sing it. <laughs> that can happen yeah, in this country. Me want Jack. Me be beach. Lovely. That beach is mine. I could bathe any time. And he wasn't talking about Jack Warner. <laughs> <laughs> so in my humble opinion, the main, in my, in my humble opinion, the main reasons for the acceptance of the Calypso as a tool for education or as an instrument for institutional study are the outstanding melodies and lyrics that have been used in the Calypso. According to David Rudder, the Calypso contains lyrics, quote, to make a politician cringe and turn a woman's belly into jelly. <laughs> Beautiful, eh? Calypsonian juke in trying to unravel what Calypso intones, he says, it is a feeling that comes from deep within, a tale of joy or one of suffering. It's an editorial in song of the life that we undergo. That and only that I know is true Calypso since 68. The art form was accepted since academics and upper class citizens grew to marvel at the lyrical and musical ability of the Calypsonians who without a university degree could put academics to shame, who without a knowledge of music theory Rhythmic studies or musical notation could compose melodies that could make the world gape in wonder. Here, for example, I want to give you two melodies of Maggie by Kitchener and Beginner's Louise. Beautiful melodies. And I'll tell you why. Because I was in, I was in Haiti, you know, and I, I met two, two doctor, doctoral persons in music, uh, PhDs in music, and they asked me, they said, um, what school Kitchener went to? I said, why you ask that? They said, to compose that melody, what school you went to? I said, oh, oh I know, I remember. The University of Woodford Square. <laughs> <laughs> Come, Larry Lang, as the people sing. Now is the time on Carnival Day. I want you to come in town. Don't you let me down. Just put on your morning duster and meet me on by the corner. We will be raging as it is said and painting the tongue in red. We go make back now for the carnival. Whenever I hear a young man playing a guitar, I say, you can play guitar? He say, say, yes. I say, play these chords to me. Maggie. Bam, 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 be, do, bam, bo. Kitchen, I say, Baba di, Baba do. Baba do, ba do. Find the chord. La ba ba bi ba ba. When you can, when you can play that, you can play guitar. That's why I ain't play it. <laughs> I 
Daniel Luis. Luis, hope is not in vain. Please come back again, Luis. Hope is not in vain. Please come back again. Miss your friendship when you sing. Miss your friendship, everything, oh girl. I now realize that I lost my paradise. Darling, do do. Please don't get me blue, oh land. Every time I turn in the bed, I take the pillow for you. And he used to have um, he used to have the high octave going up there. Darling, do do. Please don't make me blue. Playing in the harmony, see. And of course, listen to the wonderful melody and exciting lyric of Sparrow's Education. Children go to school and learn well. Otherwise, later on in life, you will catch you alive. Without an education in your hand, your whole life will be pure misery. You better off there. For there is simply no room in this whole world. Don't allow idle companions to lead you astray. To earn tomorrow, you got to learn today. See, actually, you should take that as the, as the motto. Acceptance of the Calypso for institutional study, lovely, is empirically documented by my own life as a Calypsonian and teacher. In 1968, I was charged and literally dismissed from teaching for singing Calypso by, by, by night and teaching by day. They had a big headline, teacher, teacher by day, Calypsonian by night. And yet in 1987, 20 years afterwards, I was reading for a PhD at the University of Michigan, backed financially by the government of Trinidad Tobago to study Calypso. Come back home, Chucky. Jump on seaweed. And to crown it all, I was made professor of Calypso Arts by the University of Trinidad Tobago in 2009. All them big boys in the business. From acceptance of the art and its past, I turn to the future. What is the journey ahead for the art form? To me, the road ahead has already been paved by the beautiful and conscious lyrics that underscore the Calypso, and therein lies its greatest strength. Of course, there are many lessons to be learned from its musical structure in terms of the key used, and why in terms of the melodic sequences, and in terms of its chord structures and patterns. All such questions for a CXC examination in music and the arts are there to be asked. Why, for example, do Calypsonians use the minor key? Listen to Sparrow. I'm a slave from a land so far. I was caught and I was brought here from Africa. Well, it was licks like fire from the white slave master every day. I don't want any. And it took weeks and weeks to cross the seas to reach to the West Indies. Then they made your work. Yes, I work so hard each day. And then I toil, I toil, I toil, I toil so hard, no pain. I'm crying. That's safe right here. Mm -hmm. Dying. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 Oh Lord, I want to be free. So we use the minor key to create feelings of sadness, oppression, melancholia, and empathy. And the same can be seen in Gabby's Emma Turner. Tell me to forget 
that my grandmother was born right here, so all right, I say, I shall go. You tell me to forget that is there I want my own children to grow. All right then, I say, I shall go. But I hope you understand how I feel about Emma Town, my homeland, my homeland, my home. Help me, help me. And I hope you know it's true that I love No wonder Dame, Hinda, Dame Nita Barrow requested that it be played at a funeral. When I first heard it, I, I realized that if ever there was a manifestation of God, that melody is. And there are so many, I always tell Gabby that, and there are so many questions to be asked by CXC. To whom is Gabby addressing the song? What a wonderful opportunity to use a verse of Calypso as a tool for examination and for learning by asking students in the realm of music and the social sciences to comment on its musical and structural elements. The Calypso by Gabi is rhyme. It is history. It is historiography. What have they done to Emerton? What have they done to Emerton physically? What have they done to em um, Emerton affectionately? the values of a society crushed. And there are those who feel that Africans have rhythm and percussion and not melody. Who says so? Emerton is proof of the sweet melody associated with Africans and with some calypsos. And the way ahead in terms of the calypso as a tool for institutional study is in the field of ethnomusicology. Ethnomusicology teaches us that you cannot separate music from a person's culture. You have to look at all the constructs that lead to the music. Pan is not simply pan. Kaiso is not simply kaiso, but the life of a people expressed in its lyric. For us in the Caribbean and in, and the, and in CXC, ethnomusicology is the way to go in the future. Ethnomusicology teaches us that music carries with it all the manifestations of a people's culture. So the musician or the musicologist sees and hears the minor key in Emerton. But the ethnomusicologist sees and hears the music as well as the bulldozers pushing down the houses. They see the values gone. They hear the traditions bulldozed. They see the labor of the enslaved to build Emerton. They see the many souls who perish to build Emerton. They see the many susu they save to build their homes. They see the many grandmothers who socialize their children in the Bajan way of life. And they see all the African habits of the African peasantry. And in terms of, in terms of melody, look at Kitchener. She parade in front of Kitchener. Well, as man, she make me money, man. When I see she start to dingoli, that is when I start to make me plead. Look at the first and the third line. La da di da 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 di da da. Here the third line. La da di da 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 de do da. Perfect harmony. First and third, second and fourth. Perfect harmony, if everyone. Kitchener. All lines measured. All have nine syllables. La da di da 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 di da da. La da di da 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 da. He never went to school, you know. He never went to music school. Kitchener. In terms of lyrics, the Calypso needs to be examined for there are so many themes stressed within. There is the narrative, the political, the humorous, the philosophical. I wish I had time to give you all these examples. The commentary, the various male-female relationships. There are questions of identity, of race, of unity, of Caribbeanness, all firmly expressed in the lyrics of Calypso. All such questions can be explored by the CXC examiners to show students the role and function of Calypso and Calypsonians. And when these concepts are examined, then will our youth see that the Calypsonian, humble he may be, humble and lowly esteemed though he may be, has climbed to great heights on the ladder of critical thought. Then will the youth see that the Calypsonian is a social scientist in his own right. Truly, it takes 
a social scientist to note after carnival the following. But when Ash Wednesday come and pass, the people just go back to their race and class. So the only thing to keep them together is mass. Valentino. And he left school in fourth standard. We must emphasize the lyrics of the Calypso in future CXC examinations, if only because the Calypso is to a large extent the defining art form of Caribbean regional integration. It, more than federation, was the clarion call to call the, and bring the disparate groups of oppressed people together after emancipation. What marks in the Calypso tradition have caused it to further this ideal of togetherness? First, it is the medium of our feasts, our carnivals, our rituals. Second, it has retained its African rhythmic characteristic, driving us to gay abandon. Third, all can bask in its messages. It carried the news in the absence of CNN and continues to do so. And fourth, it is our hidden transcript. It is our hidden transcript, the infra politics of the dispossessed and the subordinate, the people's medium to revenge all those who made us bend under the yoke of colonialism and neocolonialism. Thus at present, because of Gabi, Jack and his cohorts know now that the beaches of Barbados are open to all. And the government now understands the role and the function of the soldier's boots. And if you are interested in poetry or language or in language teaching, the Calypso has so much to offer. First, allow me to point out that besides the lyrical verses that express satire and irony and double entente, there are over 100 recorded Calypsos for every figure of speech in the English language. Metaphor, simile, onomatopoeia, hyperbole, personification, alliteration. Well, you talk about puns. What a beautiful way to promote the art form if used by CXC in the teaching of English. What a beautiful way to show that our Caribbean people, like others, are master poets. Time doesn't permit me to give you any examples, but let me give you a few. Red plastic bag, a master of satire, if ever there's one. And the use of the figures of speech, here, here, here. You don't have Calypso. And he showed, the, he showed, showing to the masses all, he, he has one where he showed the masses all the, all the heroes of Barbados, and he says, leave Errol Barody. A pun on the word there, of course, leave Errol Barody. In the Calypso, he uses a metaphor to describe one of the Bajan leaders marching through Bridgetown. He says, the grand old Duke of York. <laughs> like some of you know it? <laughs> or Sparrow singing on the downfall of the British Empire. Sparrow sing, London bridges falling down. Or plain clothes singing about Chambers. Chambers, D-O-N-E-S-W. Chambers, don't see. He's the Prime Minister, he could see everything. <laughs> of course, he meant D-U-N-C-Y. Or Pink Panther this year, trying to travel out of Port of Spain, and he says, I can't find the leadership. And while I'm on English, the creolized, colloquial tongue of the Calypsonian has so many lessons to teach our youth. So many lessons for CXC to ask. What, for example, does sketch mean by Dingoli? What do the extempo men mean by Sandimanity? Very often, you know, we encourage our children to quote Shakespeare and John Keats and William Wordsworth. Very good and cite Winston Churchill and hundreds of foreign academics in, their, in writing their social sciences and their, their social science projects, uh, projects. We never tell them that in every sphere of human thought, Calypsonians have given us hundreds of proverbs, sayings, and quotes that may put foreigners to shame. I can give you hundreds of examples if I have time, but let me give you a few. <laughs> so Sparrow, Sparrow singing about New York. And when all of us go to New York, Bajan, Grenadian, etc., he says, It ain't have no who is who. New York equalized you. That beautiful, eh? You ain't no Bajan again in New York, you know. New York equalized you. Then you realize you're a Caribbean man. Pretender, writing about the greatness of a woman, he opined, Look at this. Woman. The masterpiece of God's creation plan. In other words, of all the things that God has created, all the masterpieces he has made, woman. 
Isaac Caleb Sonyan, you know. <laughs> Roaring Lion reminded us that six feet of earth does bring us down to one size. Black Stallion watched all them young fellas dressed in the dashiki. African Liberation Day walking through Bridgetown. And Black Stallion said, wearing dashiki is fine, but changing your clothes doesn't change your mind. It's good for us to remember. I must sing you this one because this, one, this guy is dead. Um, Almanac. Hear what he sang. And he's a, he was a blind Calypsonian. He sang. I'm your brother, you're my sister. Yes, we are each other's keeper. Give love to all the faithful and learn to live with one another. Turn away from all that's evil. See Christ in every soul and come on, people, build a better world. See Christ in every soul. Which priest ever tell you that? Valentino has one for all of us. Valentino has one for all of us. All of us thinking people. Birds that fly high must come down to die. Or oh, you're big, you feel you're big. You're, you're, you're pushing around the people and them. You're in CXN, you're pushing around all the clerks and them. Birds that fly high must come down to die. You know, I must give you this one before I, before I close. You know, Lloyd Bess was giving a lecture one day, and he was saying, we are, we are suffering from pecuniary strangulation. You know Lloyd Bess and the big words. We are suffering from pecuniary strangulation. We are being incapacitated by our pockets. And the, nobody is talking. Nobody is talking. I fell in the audience. How do you mean somebody is talking? All of us, Calypso don't talk. He said, no, no, no. Nobody is talking. The fellow said, but Calypso don't talk. Lord said, what Calypso don't say? He said, shadow. Pressure. <laughs> the crying tongue is pressure. But here, Lord Bess, here, Lord Bess. I am suffering from pecuniary strangulation. Ladies and gentlemen, what a journey the Calypso has had. It now presents the CXC with the privilege of and challenging opportunity to unravel the journey from Africa to the Caribbean, from pre-emancipation times to the 21st century, from plantation and backyards to neon lit halls, from so-called folklore to world music, from the creative drum to Tok Tok music, and from the Tok Tok band to electronic instruments and 21st century technology. It is a journey that needs to be embedded in the psyche of our Caribbean youth, so if only to give them a sense of identity, a sense of Caribbean commonality, and a sense of how our ancestors shaped the world that today they could enjoy. It, <clears throat> it is an art form fashioned in the womb of Africa and developed on Caribbean plantations. Carries, it carries with it reminders of all the materials that have been used to build Caribbean society. After 40 years of CXC, we need to make up for the wrong done to the wrongs, I should say, done to Calypsonians and Calypso music by starting the Reformation now. <clears throat> there are notable persons such as Trevor Marshall and Adonijah in Barbados, Dobri Nomad in Antigua, Merle and Albino Dikoto and yours truly in Trinidad, who ought to be commissioned to produce a book of Calypsos that will serve handily as a source book for students to study. And when completed, the Barbadian student will not be able to say that the exam was favorable to the Trinidadian. It will be documented, when completed, to be documented with calypsos that will, that will reflect musical measurement, chord patterns, minor and major keys, commentary, humor, philosophy, entertainment, and male-female relationships. In it, we will include calypsos that will speak to themes such as migration, poverty, ethnicity, unity, racism, injustice, corruption, prejudice, identity, political development, colonialism, 
national independence, and even election fraud. <laughs> Moreover, the students will not only see empirical data relevant to all these themes, but they will be led to understand that they can use the Calypso as a form of citation for their many projects and written essays. And when this is done, then and only then will they see that Gabi is no ordinary soul, but is deserving of his knighthood. <laughs> most, most tertiary institutions today tend to focus their eyes and spirits on science and technology. Nothing wrong with that. They tend to forget that the most important aspect of technology is the human mind. And that power gained from science and technology is not enough to make us strong. Power gained from science and technology is not enough to make us strong. The heart must also sing the human song. Life is pleasant for those who have money and enjoying all luxury. But if you're poor and have to work daily, well then, life is misery. Whether you're poor, you're tired or hungry, day and night you must hit the street to face all the strife in the midst of life while you're fighting to make ends meet. you got to keep on working hard, going until you're smelling bad. And in the evening when the sun goes down, I fuss you're tired. Oh, my lad, but you're coming back the following day Cause you really need the extra pay To buy food, to be strong enough To come back and work hard, 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 hard. CXC, CXC, you have worked hard in the past. Go home now. Come back and work hard. Understand that all you have is just the water and sun. 